trauma and memory error both play a significant role in shaping the narrative in the Final Fantasy franchise, and they have since the series debuted in 1987. Making use of the four-part Eastern Kicho Tenketsu method to storytelling, it is often within the so-called twist section where players learn of, or experience a remication of, a certain character's traumatic history that often result in some form of amnesia or identity crisis. The game-long development rooted in recovery is thus crucial in strengthening the bond between a character and the player. Unsurprisingly, associative music also plays a significant role in the Final Fantasy franchise. Beginning with the Super Nintendo release of Final Fantasy IV, compo composer Nobuyu Amatsu began employing leitmotivic soundtracks comprised of character themes and a recurring main theme, both of which typically endure some level of transformation over the course of the soundtrack. Though character themes are fairly straightforward in their associativity, symbolism surrounding the main theme is ambiguous, to put it mildly. Edith Lang and George West's 1920 publication for organists accompanying silent film encourages performers to associate main themes and their transformations with the mood or character of the hero or heroine. Contrarily, in a 1999 interview, Nobuyo Matsu states that the main theme is the first piece that he composes after reading a game's screenplay, suggesting that he may connect this theme more to the underlying narrative of the game, or, to borrow a term from composer Winifred Phillips, the intangible aspect of the story. Indeed, the term main theme has been attributed officially and unofficially to many different pieces within a given soundtrack, including title music, opening credits music, world map music, or simply the most often heard music in a game, regardless as to whether or not it endures subsequent transformation. Beginning with Final Fantasy IV, Yumatsu began to blur the rhetorical boundaries between character themes and main themes, resulting in a curious type of musical and narrative ambiguity. These techniques often surround characters who are victims of traumatic memory-altering experiences, which ultimately leads to fascinating narratological questions. If the main theme of a game, which often reflects the story's narrative, is somehow connected to the character theme, then what symbolic connection and interpretation may be garnered when these themes are seemingly combined? I have identified five different compositional techniques found in Uematsu's leitmotivic soundtracks that contribute to this sense of associative ambiguity. This results, ultimately, in a type of thematic disassociation, which surprisingly helps to reveal the story's underlying narrative. Among these techniques are eponymous omission, motivic networking, thematic hybridization, associative troping, and the double E-Day fix. These techniques are often combined together, further enriching the symbolism within a given soundtrack. In this paper, I address these techniques within Uematsu's leitmotivic Final Fantasy soundtracks with specific attention given to Final Fantasy V, VII, VII, VIII, and IX. I demonstrate how these techniques lead us to discover new leitmotifs, which provide us with necessary insight to decipher the true underlying narrative theme within these beloved stories. Final Fantasy IV employs two recurring themes over the game, the main theme and various transformations of Red Wings. Though Cecil does not contain an eponymous theme, Sean Atkinson depicts how Red Wings transforms into Paladin Knight once Cecil renounces evil, suggesting that Red Wings does in fact belong to Cecil. However, Red Wings also appears in other scenes not exclusively associated with Cecil, the most common being Cry of Sorrow Part 1, which accompanies tragic plot points, like the scene where Palam and Parham turn themselves into stone to save their comrades. This track is always followed by Cry of Sorrow Part 2, a melancholic transformation of the A section to the game's main theme. Marrying these two phrases together is an example of thematic hybridization that suggests a deeper connection between Cecil and the game's underlying narrative. This connection is indeed confirmed during the game's ending credit sequence. Here, the A section to Red Wings is answered by the B section to the main theme, creating a complete and fully optimistic musical theme fitting for the story's ending. Thus, the redemption that Cecil experiences through his transformation is combined with the game's main theme, musically suggesting that redemption is the game's underlying narrative. Yumatsu's techniques matured to an interesting level of subtlety in Final Fantasy V. The main theme endures four transformations within the first ten minutes of gameplay, all of which utilize different topics and accompany scenes depicting different characters. This suggests that the main theme represents something deeper than simple character association. 
We first hear the main theme in the title credits, accompanying Bart's riding his chocobo, making prominent use of the hero topic in the A section. The B section moves to the surprising key of the dominant minor, providing a new lyrical melody before eventually concluding and looping back to the beginning. This B section foreshadows Princess Lena's eponymous theme, which is comprised of a single melody in the singing style whose antecedent phrase is motivically derived from the main theme's B section. Lena's music concludes with a nostalgic music box statement of the game's main theme. This process of thematic hybridization and motivic networking suggests a strong narratological connection between Lena and the main theme. The transformation of the hero topic into one of nostalgia suggests that Lena's past is somehow connected to the heroic narrative imbued within the game's opening music. Indeed, it is not until the final act of the story that we learn the significance of this musical connection. During a flashback, we learn that when Lena was a child, her mother had a fatal illness that could only be cured by the tongue of the Windrake, an endangered species of dragon. Though Lena tried to kill the last remaining Windrake to save her mother, her father's servant stopped her. She learns that her mother would rather die than kill the last remaining dragon. In this single traumatic event, Lena learns the true meaning of heroism and dedicates her life to saving the species. Here, it is suggested that the intangible aspect of the game's narrative is heroism through self-sacrifice. This view is reaffirmed in the scene's musical accompaniment, Sorrows of Parting, a melancholic tune comprised of three eight-measure phrases. Through the developing variation process, we see that the melody's presentation phrase is motivically derived from the consequent phrase of Lena's theme, which is further fragmented in its continuation phrase. Though Lena's theme does not endure any transformation like the main theme, its own melody is the product of, and contributes further to, the developing variation process, which ultimately acts intrinsically with the drama, thus satisfying Matthew Bribbert's or Stull's criteria for the genuine leitmotif. From the beginning of the story, the main theme and Lena's theme are motivically and topically connected, but their narrative connection remains unknown. When players learn of Lena's past, however, the nostalgia and heroism imbued in these two themes finally blend into one. What results is a slight variation on David Neumeier's tropological shift in cinema. Here, what occurs is not two opposing interpretations of a single piece of music, but a completed interpretation of three musical tracks, thus completing our understanding of their musico-dramatic connection. In the interest of time, and because I have presented on this topic elsewhere, I will forego a lengthy discussion of these techniques within Final Fantasy VI. What I will say, however, is that through various motivic, harmonic, and topical characteristics, Final Fantasy VI's main theme, as initially depicted in Omen, is associated with the game's antagonist, Emperor Gestal. Its subsequent transformations begin to strip the theme of its characteristics associated with Gestal and align them closer with Terra, one of the game's leading protagonists who suffered amnesia due to traumatic mind-controlling experiments that she endured at the hand of the Gestal Empire. Through the developing variation process, accompanimental figures heard in the strings of the main theme first iteration eventually blossoms into a B section heard in Terra's theme, which musically depicts the hope that the rebellion sees in her, which I argue is the underlying narrative of the game. 
In the game's ending credits, this B section initiates Terra's curtain call, and through what Robert Hatton refers to as a process of abnegation, we see how this music elevates the entire dramatic discourse of the game from a heroic tragedy to one of spiritual transcendence. In perhaps the most notorious example of trauma and memory error in the series, Final Fantasy VII's Cloud Strife suffers dissociative amnesia and false memory syndrome as a combined result of his traumatic childhood, later genetic experimentation, and the death of his best friend Zack Fair. He unknowingly adopts Zack's identity and is simultaneously led to believe that he is a failed Sephiroth clone. These plot points remarkably are all foreshadowed and reflected in the game's soundtrack. Though Yuamatsu provides themes for almost every character in the game, Cloud is the only one who lacks clear musical association, possibly as a reflection of his identity crisis. This has led many to suggest that the main theme is in fact Cloud's theme. Though I disagree with this assessment, I do believe that his leitmotif is embedded within the main theme, which is the longest and most formally complex of Yuamatsu's Final Fantasy soundtracks. Beginning in G major, we first hear motive X, or the main theme proper, immediately interrupted by motive Y, comprised of a short two-note statement that oscillates between F minor and its chromatic submediant D flat minor. This Y motive, I argue, is Cloud's leitmotif and light harmony. Motive Y consists of three submotives: harmonic movement of a third, or YH, melodic motion of an ascending minor second, or YM, and a melodic movement of a descending third, or YHM, which is itself based off the melodic movement of the chords. Remarkably, these three submotives are what differentiate the various transformations of the main theme as a non-leitmotivic cyclic theme from Cloud's genuine leitmotif. To be sure, Cloud's YM and HM motives are only found in transformations of the main theme that directly refer to Cloud's past, Anxious, Hearts, on Anxious Heart, On That Day Five Years Ago, and Who Am I? Likewise, non-leitmotivic transformations of the main theme mostly consist melodically of motive X, with a common use of the YH motive comprised of a simple diatonic submediant or the chromatic submediant found in the Aeolian cadence. In this way, Yuumatsu harmonically unifies the various transformations of the main theme, connects Cloud directly to the main theme, and musically aids the players in exploring Cloud's past and his subconscious. These short videos demonstrate all three transformations of the main theme embedded with Cloud's leitmotif and light harmony that exclusively accompany scenes depicting his traumatic recall of events or his recovery. The soundtrack to Final Fantasy VIII is unique in that, according to the composer, it does not contain a main theme. Indeed, it was during his time composing for this game when Yuumatsu realized that he had an unconscious predilection for using the main theme as the world map music in his previous soundtracks. Although Liberi Fatali was initially composed after reading the screenplay, Yuumatsu decided to forego its use as the world map music in Final Fantasy VIII. Instead, opting for the non-transformative and innocuous Blue Fields to accompany players as they explore the world. Yuumatsu also intentionally chose not to include character themes for the protagonists. To make matters more confusing, Yuumatsu also views Eyes on Me, which represents the romantic relationship between Squall and Renoa, as a second main theme. Yuumatsu states, quote, Both songs had become the main theme. I myself couldn't decide which one to be the main theme, that's why a main theme does not exist in Final Fantasy VIII. There are a few interesting things to dissect with this statement. 
First, Yuamatsu suggests both that there are no main themes and that there are two main themes. In fact, Liberi Fatali and Eyes on Me are recurring themes throughout the game, reflecting the double ide fix technique. Second, if the main theme is the first piece that Yuamatsu composes after reading a screenplay, one can't help but wonder whether he writes some music for the opening cinematic title screen or the world map first. Based on Yuamatsu's remarks, it seems as if the former is the case in Final Fantasy VIII, but the first three Nintendo games did not include this type of opening cinematic. Though Final Fantasy VII's opening cinematic is aptly accompanied with a track called The Opening, which also motivically connects to the light stream heard later in the game, it also includes a track titled Main Theme to Final Fantasy VII, unlike Final Fantasy VIII. Additionally, the opening cinematic scene to Final Fantasy IV is accompanied by Red Wings, not the official main theme to Final Fantasy IV, which accompanies the world map. Yuamatsu's statement that there is no main theme in Final Fantasy VIII after refusing to employ Liberi Fatali for the world map music seems to suggest that for him, the world map music should be the main theme. More importantly, his decision to forego this piece as the world map music suggests a reluctance on his part to use music associated with antagonists as such an important theme. It only seems fitting that Yuamatsu would have this type of compositional crisis for a story where most protagonists suffer amnesia from being overexposed to guardian forces. However, the inherent ambiguity actually helps us to decipher the story's most important narrative theme. Though Liberi Fatali translates to fated children, referring to the main protagonists and their collective past, the track's opening phrase, Fithos Lusek Vikos Vinosek, is an English anagram for both Succession of Witches, the associative music for the game's antagonists, and Love, two of the most important narrative themes in the game. Liberi Fatali is an intense, dramatic, and dark piece of music, and though it seems to overtly associate with Ultimecia, it covertly points to love as the underlying theme. This is ultimately reflected in Yumatsu's decision to employ a second main theme that depicts Squalls and Renoa's relationship. Unlike Final Fantasy IV, the use of the double ide fix does not marry the two themes together, but through the text, its hidden anagram, and the use of the second main theme, Yuamatsu suggests that the love shared between Renoa and Squall is but a mere representation of the game's overall theme of love. Final Fantasy IX marks Yuamatsu's last Final Fantasy soundtrack as solo composer and a return to the high fantasy narrative setting that was established in the first five games of the franchise. It also marks Yuamatsu's return to the use of character themes, though the inherent symbolism is no less ambiguous than prior games. The soundtrack makes prominent use of two main themes that endorse significant transformation, Dagger's theme and the opening title music, The Place I'll Return to Someday. Although Zidane has his own eponymous theme, its treatment is mostly superficial. Indeed, his traumatic past and future seem to be associated instead with the game's title music. This track enjoys a tripartite function. It evokes a musically nostalgic atmosphere that teleports the player to the medieval renaissance age, appropriate for the game's setting, and as a result, it transports players emotionally to their own youth, which is when they likely encountered their first Final Fantasy title. More importantly, I argue, is that it also foreshadows Zidane's own past, something that he spends the entire game trying to remember. In the story's final act, Zidane travels to his dystopian homeworld of Terra, accompanied by its eponymously named theme, itself a transformation of The Place I'll Return to Someday that combines the fitting nostalgic topic with an interesting New Age aesthetic, resulting in a musical trope on the former. It is here where Zidane discovers the truth of his past, that he was created as an angel of death to bring destruction to the planet Gaia.
The party eventually travels through Memoria, where Zidane learns more disturbing details of his past, to the Crystal World, the center and life force of the universe that lives within the planet Gaia. Accompanying Crystal World is a dystopian New Age transformation of the series Crystal Prelude, sometimes referred to as the series' main theme, through its abundance of harmonic and sonic dissonance. This disturbing transformation of the beloved Crystal Prelude provides a unique commentary on both Zidane's and the player's view of the past, memory, and nostalgia. Indeed, though Zidane wanted more than anything to learn about his past, it was not at all what he had expected, nor what he had hoped for. The distorted Crystal Prelude reflects this unfortunate realization. That Zidane calls Dagger's theme, Our Song, at the end, at the end of the story, reflects his mindset to look forward toward the future and not to dwell on the past. Similarly, the Crystal Prelude holds a significant nostalgic value for the players, whose demand for a return to the roots was at least partly responsible for the game's design and compositional choices. By presenting a Crystal Prelude in such a dystopic way during the last dungeon, where Zidane essentially confronts his past, Yumatsu suggests that while nostalgia might be a nice escape and bring about pleasant memories, one should not conflate it with a false sense of the past, nor should we dwell on it. This seems to indicate that the underlying theme of the story has to do with letting go of the past and looking forward toward the future. It only seems fitting that this game was the last soundtrack in the franchise that Yomatsu helmed as a solo project. Including this track in the game's final dungeon provides a nice bookend to the entire series, as the original presentation of the Crystal Prelude is the music that launched the entire series over a decade prior. Trauma and memory error have indeed become one of the most common recurring plot devices in the Final Fantasy franchise. It is true that some of the most important moments within the, these games involve exploring the root of protagonists' psychological state and their ability to come to terms with the traumatic events of their past. Moreover, their personal stories are often mere representations of the entire game's underlying narrative, which in Uematsu's case is often reflected musically in the game's main theme. And though the term main theme may be riddled with ambiguity, it is precisely because of this character trait that we are invited to conduct further investigation into the semiotic relationship between the soundtracks and the stories that they enhance. As I have demonstrated here today, by combining character themes with main themes through further dissociative techniques, we may not only decipher new leitmotifs within soundtracks, but we may also come to understand these stories on a completely different level. Thank you.